Welcome, everyone, to Season 4, Episode 122 of the Premier Pod. I'm your host, Yashpika, joined by my co-host, Tyler Chan. And in this episode, we've got a crazy one, because as you can tell if you're watching the video section, Tyler's back in the OG location. Um, I have another United kit, surprisingly enough, but uh, probably the biggest news is that we are recording this a day before the transfer deadline, but probably... I would say this is up there with this, the second biggest transfer news, or probably the biggest, is Cristiano Ronaldo. Yes, the Cristiano Ronaldo, CR7, has returned back to Manchester United. The club announced um, the transfer on Friday. It all happened super fast because, um, as we know, that we didn't record last week, but towards the end of last week, there were a lot of reports and pretty much a lot of heavy rumors linking him to Manchester City. Like a lot of the top journalists were saying that him to Manchester City is a done deal. He's going to sign. Um, and basically what happened was Man City were unwilling to pay. I believe Juventus were asking around $30 million for Ronaldo, but Man City were not willing to pay the entire amount. And they were trying to go into the next day, essentially trying to bargain for the price for Ronaldo. And that Friday morning, Ronaldo went to Juventus coach Allegri told him that he did not want to be here. He wants to leave. Allegri, you know, told him, you know, best wishes and told him he can leave. And essentially United kind of came in and hijacked the deal towards the end. We had former Manchester United players that played with Ronaldo messaging him on WhatsApp, asking, you know, what's going on, like trying to convince him to come. And then finally, I feel like in a matter of like three hours, probably one of the craziest transfer window timelines I've seen literally went from almost being a Manchester City player to basically returning to essentially returning back to Manchester United, coming back to Old Trafford um, and coming to the red side of Manchester all in a span of three hours. And the club announced it as soon as possible. And, you know, they shattered social media records. Um, They now have like Manchester United's announcements on Cristiano Ronaldo on Instagram and Twitter is the most liked post from a sports team um, ever, which is just crazy. Um, There's just so much buzz that he's back. I mean, I know obviously he's 36, but this guy is still, you know, top two player. Like you can, depending on who you ask, uh, one or two, literally the top two, like you can either put him as number one or number two in terms of best players in the world. And it's just crazy to think that in one transfer window, we saw Messi and Ronaldo leave their respective clubs and go join for Ronaldo coming back to Manchester United and, you know, Messi leaving for PSG. It's just a wild transfer window. And, um it's just crazy even at 36 he's still one of the best in the world he's still the best or the second best player in the world and he's coming to manchester united and he's ready to go he's ready to win trophies like um i don't know it's a dream come true for any manchester united fan because uh for for so many years they've been wanting him to come back as as the joke for a lot of rival club fans they say like isn't he out on loan why is he not back yet um and he finally came back and it's it's almost a dream come true i was kind of like in shock and disbelief as a United fan myself, it, it was, uh, it was hard to kind of put into words. I was just like, Whoa, like I cannot believe that he's back. This is one of the greatest players of all time. And he came back. It, it's yeah. It's unreal. It's a crazy feeling. This is the equivalent of when you play FIFA career mode, like <laughs> these transfers this summer have been insane. Like if you just had no rules, no loyalty even at times. It's just like, oh, of course, this player's never going to leave. Like, Messi's never going to leave Barcelona. And then, what do you know? Messi goes to PSG. And then, boom, just basically like a month later, Ronaldo, just out of nowhere, goes back to Manchester United. Just straight out of the blue. And when he was deemed to go to Man City for almost like a week. Like, I remember waking up that Friday morning just to see posts on Instagram, Twitter. Just all, Ronaldo's back at Manchester United. I'm like... That doesn't look like sky blue. What's going on? Where does news come from? And yeah, sure enough, they had the whole transfer, as you just mentioned, like just done in three hours. It's, they just yoinked him out of Man City. It was insane. And this is really a big stamp for what Manchester United plan on doing this season. And it's that they're going to win a trophy. Ronaldo's not going to waste his career at this point, even still playing for any club that's not trying to win things yeah. to add to his resume and to add to his career statistics. So this is big news. This is big for what they're going to aim for in Champions League, Premier League, FA Cup, everything. They're going to try to win everything. And that's going to be a, a setup for a really good title race, cup race, everything for the season. So it's it's a lot to kind of bring in all of a sudden. And for Yush, this is basically the dream 
transfer window for you. I don't know if it's going to be a better transfer window yeah. for you because I was looking at that and I was like, all right, is Luis Suarez coming back to Liverpool too? Is <laughs> is this what's going on? Is Torres coming back? <laughs> like, what's going on? So it's, it doesn't happen often when um you know when a star player leaves like one of the probably the best that the club has ever seen leaves and it's not very likely that he comes back and comes back in a position where he can actually contribute in a very positive way like maybe sometimes you get a comeback but it's like they're they're at a point where they're really near retirement where they can't really play a ton of games it's kind of just like a retirement lap of like one final you know year to just kind of play inside, you know, the respective stadiums, get a clap, just get one final run at things. But Ronaldo is still at the top of his game at 36. So this is literally, it's just, is literally one of the best players in the world coming back, coming to a club. Like when you add one of the best players to the world to your club, it just automatically puts you in title contender mode in terms of anything you try to go for. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. I know for me, when I became a Manchester United fan, um, I would watch like a ton of YouTube videos and like a lot of research and such about like the Fergie time of like, oh, what were the, you know, those times like and such. And, you know, there were so many great players that played at this club, but one player that obviously that caught everyone's eye that he, you know, he's still playing at the top of his game was Ronaldo watching his highlights at Manchester United, watching when he came back um, when he was at Real Madrid. And then finally, when he came back again at Juventus, um, it was kind of one of those things that I was like, oh, like, man, I wish I was like, you know, I wish I became a fan when he was still at the club where I could like witness him kind of, you know, going about like becoming the greatest player, like one of the greatest players of all time. And it's just crazy that now I would say even young United fans that could only like ask people that were really, you know, that were older than them or people that grew up watching Ronaldo because they were old enough, you know, now they can finally witness what it's like having Cristiano Ronaldo at Manchester United. It's uh it's pretty crazy because it's like a, it's kind of like a, like a storybook almost ending. Obviously, like, you know, we have to wait to see what happens at the end of the season, but it's almost like a, a storybook chapter, like, you know, writing a story, like the perfect way, like returning back to the club that kind of like, you know, that he turned himself into like one of the greatest players ever. Like obviously Real Madrid, his legacy is cemented there, but coming back to a club that basically nurtured him and, you know, helped him get to that level. It's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. It's kind of ironic now, too, that I'm going to be honest, I haven't really watched him play throughout most of his career as regularly as I would like a typical Premier League team. Because, yeah. you know, this is the Premier Pod. Yush and I, I mean, I can speak for myself, but I really just watch the Premier League. Yeah, I rarely too. watch La Liga, Syria. I, I watch occasionally Bundesliga here and there just because I like Dortmund and I like following that league. But in terms of like even PSG, I'm only yeah. really watching those big clubs, Barcelona, oh, Real Madrid, League. yeah, and Champions League, or if it's a big rivalry like El Clasico, or mm-hmm. if it's a maybe a title deciding game like in the Serie A with Inter Milan versus Juventus. But very rarely will I just say, "All right, I'm gonna watch a Serie A game today. I'm gonna watch Juventus play." <laughs> so very, very rarely do you get to really see Ronaldo because, like, let's be honest, who really watched Juventus the past two, three years he was there? Yeah, and then for Messi as well, he's about to go to, or he already is at PSG, and he came off the bench. I watched the highlights for that game, but I mean, they faced a team that I don't even remember, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it was kind of weird seeing Messi come off the bench wearing the number thirty. Is mm-hmm. I I know they probably haven't announced Ronaldo's number yet, but I mean he's literally CR seven. What's Edison Cavani gonna do? Is he gonna give up the number? I mean that's that's another big question. It's just all these kind of storylines still kind of just kicking off because it's like well. This came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't know what to do. And now it's going to be a lot of storylines just for even players there. Like Yosh and I, before we started the podcast, we're talking about Dan James. What's going to happen to him? And also for Mason Greenwood, what's going to happen to him? Because with Ronaldo in, he's for sure going to play. He's not going to be on the bench. So all these kind of moves to bring in Ronaldo is going to kind of shape the Manchester United team. And also possibly, well, it's it's pretty obviously going to shape the Met the whole Premier League as well. So yeah, it's it when when you you know adding a player like that caliber, like it's it's immediately going to raise the level of everyone else cuz they already added a really high quality player in Rafael Varane who won a World Cup with France, won his one Champions League with Real Madrid, has won title after title after title. So you add already a caliber of like his stature um in terms of just his 
elegance on the ball, his, you know, leadership and his, you know, the way he can just command in terms of just being a cool, calm, collected player in the back. But then you also add Ronaldo, who was his teammate at Real Madrid, who they like shared memories of winning Champions League, winning titles and such. So adding those two um, in the locker room that can share those stories and, you know, kind of like shape the younger, I would say younger squad at Manchester United, you know, the Mason Greenwoods, the Marcus Rashfords, the Jaden Sancho's, um, you know, those type of players that will look who are still in their early 20s um, that will look for that basically look up to like Ronaldo because they've watched him play. And now they're in the same locker room with him sharing those same memories. But, you know, Ronaldo's professionalism, in a sense, his um, demeanor when he comes to training every day, keeping his body up to, you know, fine tuning his body, his diet, you know, focusing on training, working really hard, all of that stuff. When you see someone else doing it, it's going to force you to like follow those same footsteps. So not only is he adding the goal scoring and, you know, that leadership, that he that you show on the field but off the field in terms of you know the training you know demanding excellence from your teammates um you know trying like you know being like the best you can in training like all of that stuff is going to filter down and all of that stuff as it accumulates that's what actually ends up winning you the title yeah it's the stuff on the field is important but it's all the little stuff in training and on the practice arena the training arena like all of that stuff adds up and adding ronaldo veron all these top quality players like it's gonna it's it's for sure going to push a lot of the members in the United squad even more to, you know, kind of have that title winning mentality and like kind of push them over the edge. Mm-hmm. And you kind of hear this kind of mentality whenever you play with a superstar or just a once in a generation kind of player, like for that Argentinian squad that played with Messi that helped him win that Copa America over the summer. Mm-hmm. You'd hear players like Lotaro Martinez saying in press conferences, like, yeah, the whole team's willing just to die for him. Like, yeah. Emmy this, Martinez too, just yeah, like Emmy Martinez <laughs> going crazy for him. It's literally that kind of situation where it's like the accountability is going to be off the charts now. It's just like he he's not here to mess around. He's here to yeah. make sure to get things done. And you know this kind of competition is going to elevate everyone. And this there's like this question I know yesterday you mentioned to me it was just like is this one of the strongest Premier League sides we've ever seen in terms of just like the top four and, yeah. and the top four we're talking about Liverpool, Man City, Man U and Chelsea. Yeah. And I would say in terms of just number of superstars and just who's there, who's playing, who's on every squad. Yeah. I would say they're pretty much up there, but you know, the proof will be in the pudding is what they call it. I think that's the right idiom, but yeah. <laughs> you know, cause like even two years ago, the Europa League final and the Champions League final. Yeah. Or was English. that three years ago? It was all English. And I was yeah. like, all right, that was or definitely even, a year. Or I was going to say even this one, but uh, that didn't happen. But yeah, like you know, <laughs> two years. I think it was actually, I think it's three years now that it was 2019, 20. Yeah. So it was like, Liverpool, Tottenham, and then Chelsea, Arsenal. That, mm-hmm. that, oh, so that I guess season. you had two years then. Yeah. But basically that I'm going to say was a for sure year. All the English teams were the best in mm-hmm. all of Europe. So this year, if we see something like that repeat, then for sure, it's going to confirm that. But I mean, just on paper right now, assuming everyone's always available, everyone's it's crazy. 100%. This is, this is going to be one of the most it's wild, hi- highly anticipated seasons that we've seen. And I, I know we mentioned that at the preview, but now adding even more gasoline to the fire, <laughs> like this is insane. Like this is literally just instead of just pouring through a hose you just took the whole canister and just chucked it in to yeah the fire. this is insane it's so. uh it, it's honestly great i think personally i think it's one of the strongest it's ever been because uh not only did we add united add one of the greatest players of all time but you know the a player that's literally you can argue is number one or number two in the world right now still currently at his age and probably won't drop off you know i wouldn't say anytime soon considering how well you know when you keep up with your body and everything but adding that and then Chelsea bringing back Romelu Lukaku to the Premier League. He's coming back. Um, Manchester City, you know, adding Jack Grealish to their side only makes them stronger in the attacking wise. Liverpool adding some depth in the center back pairing. And then Liverpool, obviously, if they can stay healthy, that was the same squad that won the title two seasons ago. So that's the same, essentially the same squad. So all those players know how to win titles. They've won a Champions League before. Um, It's, the the entire like the top four for sure it's you know if you're not one of those four teams unless they mightily screw up 
I'm sorry. Like if you're Arsenal, Tottenham, um, you know, Leicester, Leicester it's just, I don't think it's going to be your year to kind of crack in. It's, it's going to be too hard. It's just so top heavy this year. The, the two, the top four teams. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just speaking on just transfers alone, I don't know even Liverpool, they didn't bring in anyone besides <laughs> Konate, but geez, everyone else, it just seems like they just splashed the cash. And although it's it was kind of different for every team, like Man City, they really only brought in one player and it was mm-hmm. Jack Grealish. But, you know, Manchester United, they kind of spread the wealth a little bit and brought in a few players just to change the whole team. But I feel like this season, everyone kind of made some moves that would change the face of the team in some ways where it's like that starting 11 is going to change a little bit based on yeah. the players they brought in but i mean we'll, we'll have to see how this yeah. season goes out because you know three games in and it's it's still a little all over the place you see like yeah. tottenham at the top you see it, it's still yeah, it's, and the arsenal still dead last so yeah it's tight it's it's, it's gonna be wild but i i want to mention like um just a couple more points on ronaldo i know this is uh i don't want to make this entire ronaldo episode even though it could be on its own but um mm-hmm. I, I know a lot of pundits were saying this and a lot of former United players, but me personally as a fan, since I've been watching United and like I started watching them in the 2014-15 season, which was the first season under Louis van Hall, and every time I'd watch United, I was just always hear commentators saying, uh, like this is not, you know, old United would always be on the front foot attacking. Like you would be excited to watch Manchester United play. And under Louis van Hall, we never really got that. Jose Mourinho, obviously, we never got that. Um, under Solskjaer, in the beginning, yeah, it was there, but you could tell that this whole process needed ta- needed to take time. But man, adding Ronaldo, it just seems like all the pundits were saying this, but I legitimately cannot wait when they get back into Old Trafford, when they come out of international break against Newcastle. Um, that stadium, if Ronaldo plays and he comes in the starting lineup, he walks out of that tunnel. I'm not joking. I feel like that that entire stadium is just going to like be insane. Like, absolutely, like, it's going to be buzzing the entire stadium because they were on their feet cheering for Rafael Varane when he was unveiled. But I just cannot imagine because you can ask any United fan, like, there's this special connection, I feel like, with Cristiano Ronaldo if you're a Manchester United fan. Even if you were a United fan that didn't get to grow up watching him and you were just, like, a newer United fan, there's this, like, special magic and lure of, like, Cristiano Ronaldo. Every time he played against us, whether it was at... Real Madrid or Juventus, there was never a sense of like, oh, we're going to start booing him because he's a former player. Like it was always kind of like a mutual respect um, type thing. And the fact that he's coming back, like the Old Trafford, it's going to be much worse, like literally must watch television, even if you're not a United fan to see the reception he'll get um, when he walks out of that tunnel as a Manchester United player again. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is really a storyline that even if you don't really follow soccer too much, it's just like you you definitely should watch this like 100%. It's just, it, it's kind of surreal. Like I was trying to think of an analogy for what this would be in like... Like the only thing I can think of is NBA when LeBron James left went Cleveland. Back to Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, went back to Cleveland. Um, but obviously he left to go to the LA Lakers, but like that's the, honestly like the entire, in terms of like buzz, that's like the closest thing I can think of in terms of like, team like going back to a team that like you grew up basically learning your craft and then you left to go you know basically become the best player in the world somewhere else and then now you're coming back to help bring back that team to win like a trophy and such um that's the closest thing i could think of um i can't i can't really think of another like I don't know another like storybook like type of type of like play like in terms of sports where it's terms of like the player is still at the top of his game coming back to the club. I I don't know. It was just it's kind of surreal. Like like you said, that's like the best way to kind of sum up the entire like this entire transfer is just surreal. <laughs> mm-hmm. I would say that's probably like the perfect analogy, just because not gonna lie, man, you the past few seasons <laughs> kind of dry on the trophies. So I mean, yeah. if Ronaldo can bring one, I mean that there you go. Yeah, and, and I. I I will yeah. say like all right, well let's see. I will say that you can go back to the beginning of this the when the podcast started or even the beginning of season two when it was uh the 2019 20 like 2019 2020 season um where it was basically Solskjaer's like first full season and we were literally playing Andreas Pereira as like the attacking midfielder, Jesse Lingard, Marcus Rashford, Anthony Martial, Dan James on the right wing. Scott McTominay, McFred, or Matic. And then Pogba was the only, like, that was a big creative force. That was it. 
Then you had Juan Bissaka or Dallo. And then you had a Luke Shaw that was still trying to find his confidence and a Harry Maguire Lindelof partnership. So all I got to say is that you can go back and check. Like there was some, there was a lot of tough times, like where I was just like, man, what is going on? Like why it was literally, we, we were playing like Ashley Young at right back and such. It was a lot of tough times, but it, it's just kind of crazy to see the transformation of the squad now compared to what it was just literally a couple seasons ago. I felt like the domino started to fall when we, once we brought in Bruno and like once we brought in Bruno, it's like holy crap! Like we realize, like all the dominoes started ticking after that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I even mentioned to you, Yush, and on the podcast as well. Just there are certain transfers that Manchester United have done in the past few seasons that I'm like, man, they got a good one. Like Bruno Fernandez, <laughs> I was like, that's a good one. And then for Varane, I was like, oh, that's also a good one. But I mean, Sancho, we're gonna see. We're gonna see. Yeah. I, I still think that's pretty good. Like it's not one hundred percent, but I'm just like, all right, that's still pretty good. But Ronaldo, that's, mm. <laughs> that's insane. So yeah. I mean, I gotta give credit for Manchester United. They're really on the up. They really started. They're not at the bottom compared to like you know Arsenal right now. But <laughs> man, it was definitely a dip. And oh, I, was, yeah. I was trying to tell I, you, I, I was like sitting through the Van Hall, sitting through the Van Hall era where you just had Daily Blind and Chris Smalling as your center backs, just like knocking back passes to each other, and then Matteo Darmian as your right back, and then left back I believe was um, Luke Shaw or Ashley Young at the time. Then you had Morgan Schneiderlin or Schweinsteiger, really old Schweinsteiger. Then you had like a really old Wayne Rooney up top with like Martial, and that was it, and a Jesse Lingard. It's it's crazy. It's literally crazy how fast the squad is like turned around. No, and then you still have Messi Lingard now. Yeah, rejuvenated Messi Lingard. Rejuvenated. We'll see if he plays, but yeah, <laughs> gotta unleash him. Literally have Messi yeah. on the bench. <laughs> Lingardinho, as they Lingardinho. call him. Man, but yeah, I mean Cristiano Ronaldo. What can we say? One of the best players in the world. Probably will literally will go down as one of the best players of all time. Um, is coming back to Manchester United, ready to win trophies. And, you know, I can't wait. I can't wait to watch that first game when he comes back. But one team that could arguably probably use one of their old legends to come back is Arsenal. Down bad, down horrendously bad right now. Um, I don't even think it's worth mentioning Man City because they're, they're like already such a good team. But Arsenal just got thumped by Manchester City 5-0. Um, Arsenal... If you don't know what's going on, they're literally right now going into international break at the bottom of the Premier League table. Zero points, zero goals scored, negative goal differential. They're basically in a firestorm right now. And I work with some Arsenal fans for my work, and they're just basically like, if you don't, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Um, and it's it's just literally one of those things where it's essentially becoming a meme at this point. And it, it was so bad that. During this game, Arsenal fans literally started cheering once Man City scored their fourth goal. Like, you realize how bad things have to go for your own fans to start cheering for the other team to score. I all I will have to say is I feel so bad for you, Arsenal fans, because this is such a good club and it's just being so poorly run at the moment. And oh man, there's just so many things that have gone wrong in this club. And I I hope I hope eventually it will turn around. But oh, it, it is some 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 tiring times right now if you're an Arsenal fan. Mm-hmm. You know, condolences to our friends that have been on the podcast are Arsenal fans you know like Cho and Nathan so yeah <laughs> it's it's not great I honestly believe this is probably one of the worst Arsenal sides I've seen in like the whole decade I've been following them and I mean on paper I've seen worser players but under Wenger as Wenger as the manager he was able to bring out the best of them and then still manage to get in the Champions League almost every single season that's honestly Meanwhile, incredible when you think about it exactly (laughs) like seeing how far they've like gone gone off um compared to where they were you know Mm -hmm. i just remember just shamak just like that striker from morocco (laughs) i'm like man they can't went from that to like obama they had our our shaman our shaman was all right yeah man some of the players in the defense too was just but (laughs) i mean going to now a lot of these players are just very much like there's they're so fringe. much potential in them. Yeah, they're all they're all like fringe players where it's just like, man, there's so much potential in them, but it's just not coming out. It's just like, man, they're just kind of stuck at the baseline of yeah. what they currently are, and it's not really unlocking what you paid all this money to. Hopefully, they'd become and blossom into like Nicola Pepe or you know Ben White. He just literally got here, but I mean, you paid fifty <laughs> million for him. 
hopefully got to do something. Yeah. And I mean, it just the list goes on even to like last season. You got like Gabrielle and then you also have uh, Saliba. And then it's just so many players that are like, you know, 20 million here, 20 million there. And like no one's showing up. Like yeah. this team is literally dead last in the Premier League projected <laughs> at this rate. <laughs> to Relegation, get relegated what are they <laughs> Sunderland so I don't think that's going to happen I think Arteta is definitely going to get sacked before that happens if Stan Kroenke has any tut- or like intuition about like the Premier League at all like this is just terrible because if you think about it too they brought all these players in and you kind of had an idea at first of what Arsenal were going for they're like oh they're going to rebuild they're going to bring in all these players of a lot of potential like Gabriel Martinelli up top as well Bakayo Saka's, you know, on the rise still. Yeah, he's one Neil of their Smith best players. Yeah, like Smith Rowe. Mm-hmm. And then they just brought in uh, the midfielder. I'm forgetting his name. Nuno like, Tavares? Basically him, yeah. Just everyone that we thought was going to be benched, yeah. but then they started playing Conga. anyway. La yeah, Lakonga, that's who I was thinking of. And, you know, the potential was there, but this ain't, this ain't FIFA. You can't just <laughs> do training attributes and just boost their passing <laughs> To from like 78 to like 94 in like two yeah. months. Like, this is not how it works. And Arsenal, they're just kind of stuck in this one point where it's like they can't get out of this mediocrity that they're kind of stuck yeah. in. Cause it's like, yeah, you bought a bunch of youth players and your team looks like a bunch of youth players. <laughs> so, it, and that was the whole process. It's just like, yeah, we'll, we'll develop them and then we'll be good. But I don't think they have enough time to do that at this rate. I don't think Arteta has the time to do that. And, you know, Mesut Ozil, he posts on Twitter, just trust the process, except it was a heartbreak emoji and a sad face emoji. Yeah. And this is the, the, the epitome of live and die by the process. Even with the 76ers, the epitome of that phrase, trust the process, they at least got to, you know, fighting for the playoffs and possibly going into the conference finals. But Arsenal, they're going backwards. Yeah. They went from challenging for champions league spots to kind of challenging for europa league and now it's like can they even get mid table can they get mid table at this point hey we apologize for any technical difficulties that have come up uh we had uh some inclement weather come up during georgia and uh part, part of our power went out so we were in the middle of talking about arsenal getting battered by man city but we're just going to go ahead and jump straight into the main talking point of that game, which was Mikel Arteta and whether we think he's going to last the entire Premier League season. And I know, Tyler, you mentioned that um, you think he's actually going to get sacked. I'll just go out and say that I think he's probably going to get sacked as well. I, you know, I don't know. It's 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 hard because I was about to say Arsenal have a lot of like mediocre players. Um, but the thing is, Arteta keeps talking about this process of like, oh, you got to trust the plan. You got to trust the process. But to me, I, I just don't see what the plan is. You know, they they they're bringing in a lot of like subpar players. They're playing a lot of subpar players, and they're just getting mediocre results in mediocre football. So, Arsenal fans, I I I was really high on Arteta, especially after when they won the FA Cup, and I thought you know this is the guy that was going to bring them back to glory. But I I just think Arteta's over his head. I think this job is just too big for him, and I unfortunately think Arsenal need to look elsewhere because I don't think Arteta is the guy to get Arsenal back to the glory days. Mm-hmm. I really think they need someone that's kind of like a Brendan Rogers, not going to lie, where <laughs> he's very good at developing young players. Someone, yeah. someone that caliber, even mm, I was going to say like a young, younger version of Klopp who kind of brought up a lot of like the Dortmund players yeah. back in the days, but now he's kind of elevated to like a new type of manager, kind of working with the teams and players that are already ready to go, ready to win right now. So, yeah. Arteta, he's not really even proven either as what kind of manager he is because this is his first gig. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't really have that many proven plans to begin with. And what the process is, is very much abstract. And we don't know what the true outcome is going to be. It's not really guaranteed. And, you know, soccer, football, the Premier League is a results-driven game and and a results-driven career and if he's not getting the wins he's not even getting the draws or the goals yeah. even no goals. we've seen he's what happens frank to frank DeBoer. yeah i was gonna say we've seen what happened to frank DeBoer <laughs> at crystal palace except this is just worse because it's even for arteta it's arteta yeah it's arsenal and this is his third season and yeah it's only gotten worse it's not like there's been a progressive 
incline or progressive leaps like you see for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer at Manchester United, where although it was kind of rough at the beginning and then rough at times here and there in the past year or two, it's slowly getting better. Mm -hmm. But for Arsenal, it's just been slowly getting worse. And I feel like at this point, the man who's at the helm, the man who's riding the ship, who's at the steering wheel, (laughs) it's Arteta. And I think you have to let him go if it's even game six or game seven and you still don't have enough wins. Because at this point, it's... It's Arsenal Football Club. You can't be at this low level of, you know, standards. It's like you have to win. You have to be fighting for Champions League every single season. And for this, it's like they're just going for mid-table at this point, at this trajectory, or even fighting relegation. But I don't think they'll let that happen. But, you know, you see what happened to Sunderland. So you, you can never see what yeah. you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think um, the vibe I'm also getting from Arsenal fans is that their sporting director, um, Adu. Um, also needs to go as well because him and Arteta have been like the main culprits of a lot of the signings they've had under this new regime. And also they've been calling on Arteta's man management, saying that his man management man management is the worst they've seen out of a coach um, because there, you mentioned a player earlier um, was uh, William Saliba, I believe. And that guy has yet to put on a uh, play a game on an Arsenal shirt, even though he's been signed for like the past two years, he's just been out on loan. And I think Arteta's reasoning is that he needs more development. But a lot of Arsenal fans saying that when they watch him in league on, he looks really good and he looks like he could slot right in as a center back um, to play for Arsenal. But um, Arteta doesn't believe that. And Arteta, Arteta's also had falling out with a couple other players like Mesut Ozil, Matteo Guendouzi, um, you know, others of that ilk. And his man management has kind of come, come into question. And there was a... Uh, Arsenal player today, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, who's kind of a fringe player right now with Arsenal, and he's looking to get a move out. And our Everton were reportedly interested in doing a loan-to-buy option for him, but Arsenal wanted a straight sell. And then um, Ainsley Maitland-Niles actually earlier today on his Instagram story literally posted, um, all I want to do is essentially just saying, I want to be at a club where I feel belong. Um, he's like, why won't you let me leave at Arsenal and this is this is so bad because this is literally your own player going on Instagram um, to like call out the club for not you know letting him go, and it just kind of shows the kind of situation Arsenal are in because not only have they I guess quote unquote had this plan that they're trying to follow, but they've also made some really weird signings like signing Willian on a free contract, signing David Luiz, you know, other players where they're over thirty or really at their peak, um, and just you know, giving them a contract. I thought the Granit Xhaka contract extension was a weird one too, because it seemed like uh, Roma were ready to like agree a fee and get him in. But, you know, this is the same guy that uh, as he was walking off the pitch with the captain's armband, he started jeering at the Arsenal fans. So a lot of their signings and a lot of their, I guess, moves in the transfer window and under the director direction of Edu and Arteta been very confusing. I feel like they they say like this big grand, you know, quote, you know, I would say quote mark plan that they're following, but I feel like honestly I I don't know if they really know what they're doing at this point cuz uh, it just, it just doesn't show with their transfer dealings and everything else they get get involved with. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, even if you saw if you watched the game, you know, Man City versus Arsenal over the past weekend, so Granit Xhaka get that red card as well. Yeah. So like on top of man <laughs> management, it's just in-game man management too, where the players are doing Arteta, stupid decisions. Yeah. It, it seems like I Lord think of the have, flies almost. Yes. I, I was going to say, the same. I, I think like, I think there's a stat out there. I think they actually have, un, since Arteta has been the manager, um, they have had the most red cards in the Premier League. Um, and I think they're mm-hmm. at like 10 or 11. And I think that's just shocking. That's just like, come on, like, you, you've got to have your players under control. And it just seems like the players just are when they get on the pitch, they just kind of do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. And I know it's Granit Xhaka, who, you know, kind of a hothead on the mm-hmm. pitch, but you got to control him. And it just looks like even when he was getting off the pitch, like Granit Xhaka was being moved off the pitch or Teta like stood up from his chair, <laughs> sitting down for him on the sideline, gave him like a little pat on the butt and then just went about. <laughs> I'm like, what? I would have like ripped a new one on him and just told him like what what was that? Now the game's gone. Like literally, mm-hmm. there's no way Arsenal are gonna come back because you're gonna be down to ten men and there's no point. It's just what's going on? They're literally toast. So 
and this is i feel like arteta is not you know headstrong enough or authoritative enough to really man that locker room because it looks like he kind of lost it it yeah. looks like it's really the players who are kind of taking lead it's kind of toxic at times too because even with Ansley Maitland, Ansley Maitland Niles. Yeah, tongue twister of a name. <laughs> there we go. Literally, there's he's kind of just out in a void too, where he doesn't know what to do. And certain other players like Joe Willick, I'm surprised he got sold to Newcastle. Yeah, this summer. And I thought he'd be like a, a building block for the future, given you know they're in a rebuild mode at Arsenal. But yeah, you know they, they let go of Willick. So it's I mean, confusing. The, it's the confusing. signs are on the wall. It's just like yeah. what is what is going on here? It, it's it's not looking good. And it also doesn't help. A lot of the players they thought were going to turn big shot for them. Um, I look at like one big player, Aubameyang. He's come under a lot of, you know, uh, you know, under the eye of a lot of Arsenal fans since he signed that new contract extension after winning the FA Cup. He just hasn't looked the same. It just seems like once he hit like that 31, 32 age, like he just kind of fell off in terms of his performances. And honestly, I don't know if he'll ever get back to being like the top level performer striking you know, striker he was. That's frustrating. Lacazette really has never kind of lived up to his price tag. Granit Xhaka obviously has not lived up to it. And they signed him. They gave him a new contract extension. There's still questions on like Rob Holding, Colum Chambers. Um, you know, I'm looking at Hector Bellerin, just hasn't looked the same, obviously, because of his knee injuries. Uh Kolasinac, which I think is very interesting that they still have him. He like when they signed him on a free from the Bundesliga from Schalke, like I thought he was going to be a pretty decent option for them at left back, but he's just been a disaster as each season has gone by. Uh, you know, the, you can just go down the list of just failed transfers or very confusing um, players. And honestly, if you look at the squad right now, the squad in general is pretty bang average, pretty mediocre, um, you know, except for a few quality players, you know, that are really bright spots for them in the future, such as. Bukayo Saka, Martinelli, uh, Emil Smith-Rowe, I would throw Odegaard in there. I, I still think Ben White can prove pretty pretty well if, as long as he's got like a better team around him. You know, there's players, there's good young players in there, but it's just kind of um, overwhelmed by the fact that they just have too many bad, mediocre players that just don't really care, I don't think, about playing for Arsenal and a lot of players that are just kind of collecting a fat paycheck at the end of the day. And I think that's what's uh, that's what's hurting Arsenal right now. Mm -hmm. It's it's not even a thing of signing bad players. It's just a majority of them turning bad. Because yeah. if you think about it, it's like it's it's something if most players going to the club are not turning out to be great. Yeah. Because I mean, if you go to other clubs, sure, you know, you get some hit or hit or misses, and that you know that's just how the game goes. You know, you send Hazard to Real Madrid, and all of a sudden. He's bad, but yeah. you, know, you know, you know, Vinicius Junior is starting to turn up now, mm -hmm. and I mean that's just usually how it is. It's just like a fifty-fifty. But for Arsenal, it's like almost <laughs> like eighty-five percent failure <laughs> rate at this point, and just like that's, very few come through. I feel like so, that has to do more with the culture, what's going yeah. on, and you know, uh, like a big signing that we haven't mentioned is Thomas Partey. He's been injured pretty much the majority of his Arsenal career, and you know. Arsenal has, uh, have had this problem for so long about players getting injured all the time whenever they sign. So I just feel like there's just the culture. Just I, I feel like they just need a cultural reboot um, and just really figure out where they want to go because I, I, I think if they continue riding this ship, it's just going to be more and more, and more pain for Arsenal fans. And I, I don't know how they can turn around from, um, from where they're at right now under Arteta and Edu um, under their leadership. Mm-hmm. So we'll have to just see how it goes for the yeah. next few weeks because, well, you know. I guess quick question. When do you think he will get sacked since both of us think uh, he'll get sacked? When do you think he'll be gone um, as Arsenal manager? I would say mm, probably by October. I think Ooh, October wow. is usually <laughs> when we start seeing that kind of transition yeah. for like a new manager. But usually they have to have a new manager lined up mm -hmm. for – replacement like they can't just sack arteta and be like all right and look into the wings it's like uh yeah <laughs> who do we bring in because at this point a lot of the main managers that you know we can all think of the household names they all kind of they're kind of set they're mm -hmm. kind of at their own clubs yeah and you try to think of any off the top of your head it's not many I mean, it's not many and it's like do you really want to settle with you know an interim manager for 
Yeah, like a Freddy Lundberg. Yeah, I think you might have to bring back <laughs> Freddy. Bring back Lundberg with the red fire hair. But, I mean, they're kind of low on options. And yeah. the ship is sinking. They got to get some duct tape or something on there. And, you know, I don't know what their process is, but they're sailing towards a destination that <laughs> seems like a pile of rocks right now. Yeah. I... um. I respect that. I think I, I think they'll give him a little bit more time. I actually think they might, because um, I think he will get sacked if they continue performing this way. I think they'll probably maybe sack him around that timeline that Mourinho was sacked for Manchester United, which they gave him, I think, Mourinho all the way through um, to December. I think they maybe sack Arteta like first week of December or maybe like a couple weeks into November um, because, you know, that gives them... You know, if the results are going this way, at least it gives them maybe a new manager bounce and it gives like whoever they bring in, if they bring in an interim or someone permanent, um, it gives them at least the January transfer window. And also it gives them that um, very important Christmas uh, fixture, uh, the holiday fixtures for the Premier League, where you can kind of mass a lot of points. Um, so maybe they can make up ground that way. But yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think Mikel Arteta will be the manager, unfortunately, Uh you know, to when we come to the end of the season, I don't think he'll be Arsenal manager anymore. Mm-hmm. Unless like a Christmas miracle happens. In yeah. September. <laughs> yeah. Um, unless they like hit the stride and literally go on a, a, a massive winning streak. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think he'll be the manager. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Arsenal are in crisis mode. Man City, obviously we're cruising, but uh, I would say the biggest game of the weekend was Liverpool, Chelsea, the big boxing fight, as they like to call it, of, of Romulu Lukaku versus Virgil van Dijk. Um, you know, I didn't get to watch too much of this game, but um, there were a couple big, big, uh, big moments in this one. The Kai Havertz header obviously um, was a big one, but then the big controversy with the Reese James red card, VAR ruling, um, ruling it as a handball, awarding the penalty to Liverpool, and then Salah dispatching from it. But you know, got to give credit to Tuchel and Edward Mendy because they held firm um, in that whole second half, playing with ten men and ten men at Anfield. They were able to just hold on for a one-one draw. So it just shows how strong and how resolute the Chelsea defense is. Mm-hmm. Chelsea, oh, I, I got to give them some credit. They literally <laughs> held on at Anfield to a one-one draw for a full forty-five minutes, like yeah. a whole second half, and just survived That's essentially. Crazy like a barrage of attacks the entire game or the entire second half of the game. Edward Mendy just stood on his head. But, you know, Tuchel is really someone that Arsenal really needs where he can be a tactical mastermind to, you know, get whatever points needed from any game. And that Kai Havertz goal, I have to, I have to give a shout out to Kai just because I know Andres, the Bayer Leverkusen fan, Kai Havertz fan, <laughs> he was sending me a lot, a lot of texts about that. He was just like, See this goal? I'm like, man, it's against my team. <laughs> but it, I, I will say it was a really good goal. It was an mm-hmm. amazing header. And I was surprised that they subbed him off at the second half. I was just like, they subbed him off instead of like Mount? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, I mean, you got to give credit to Tuchel because like ultimately it was the right move. They got the point. Mm-hmm. And it was the game kind of left after that. Reese James red card. Reese James got the red card from a goal line clearance that bounced off of his thigh and into his arm. And I I don't know if it would be a red card, but I think the fact that he kind of swung his arm slightly after it bounced off his leg into his arm. Yeah. Like a like away from the goal. That kind of constituted the red card and maybe just by you know, just the rule books if you block a goal with your hand it's a red card, so yeah, that's most likely why. But it was pretty harsh, and I feel like the game kind of left after that instant because you know it's just all Liverpool at that point. So that was where I feel like having that striker for Liverpool really was needed. You know, Firmino got subbed off, Yogo Jota was subbed on, but I mean, even then, if we had like a Lukaku or if we had you know Holland or something like that, like a mm-hmm. pure striker, I feel yeah. like we would have a pretty good chance, a little better chance, even though. Diogo Jota did have a few good chances, you know, header right near the beginning of the second half, and also a pretty good assist to a shot with Salah near the end of the game. There's just something missing. I feel like there's just something that could be done to mm-hmm. kind of bring in some more strike force. But the main thing that I saw that was pretty interesting was that Harvey Elliott, the 18 year old that was subbed, or that wasn't subbed on, but he was loaned out the past couple seasons 
to championship sides, so just like Blackburn Rovers, and had a pretty good season last season as a 17-year-old in the championship, started this game. And he played the entire game. He didn't get subbed off. He played the entire time. And he had a pretty good game. Like, he had a few good shots at goal. He set up some good chances. He had some good, like, dribbles where he can get past the player. But near the end, he kind of ran out of gas, <laughs> in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of surprised that, you know, he's traditionally more a winger. He played, I believe, right wing, but in this game, he played more of like a right center mid, kind of behind Salah. And he basically played that in the entire game. So, and he, he kind of took the spot over for Keita. Like Keita was on the bench. Chamberlain was on the bench. Oxide Chamberlain. And Minamino also was on the bench. So, and also Thiago, of all people. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Klopp is putting all of his eggs into the, the Elliott basket. And I mean, it, it is kind of showing that it's working for a little bit, but it was kind of surprising that he's kind of winning out above all these other players. Yeah. So that's, that's a surprise that I was not expecting. Like this is something that we saw Elliott play in the preseason. He was all right, but I didn't expect him just to get thrown in just straight in, just playing full matches, just like that. Mm-hmm. So, to get put into the starting 11 is pretty prestigious and to get put in the starting 11 over all these other players that who have been in the starting 11 has been subbed in played 90 minutes at times and you know is playing against chelsea like this yeah. is gonna be a top four battle that will matter way at the very end of the season i think this is gonna be a big developmental year for him but also a big kind of push for what klopp is saying is like this this kid's something special and you know I, I still say he should have been subbed off maybe around the 60th minute to get, you know, Keita in, something like that, someone to help unlock that Chelsea defense that's been so stout. And then Cesar Aspilicueta just acting like a madman, <laughs> shoving Van Dyke here and there like a spaz. But, you know, it was a little disappointing getting the tie, getting the draw, given that Chelsea were down to 10 men for an entire second half. But at the same time, I mean, I, I guess I'm glad we didn't lose. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was kind of like a mixed bag where it's like there's a little bit of hope from the tactics and the players and the personnel that we saw from this game. And the fact that, you know, players like Van Dyke, Matip, you know, Robertson, they're all back from injury and, you know, they're playing consistently now. And then also the front three, once again, playing again, mm-hmm. you know, Salah from, you know, and Mane. And then, you know, Henderson back as well. Like the the whole injury side of this team is back, but it's just like, man. Missing can they keep up? Yeah, we just need that striker. And also, it's like, can we keep up from the team that they were a few years ago that was so good and just kind of ran away with the league when all these other teams that we just mentioned at the beginning of the pod brought in all these players, brought in Ronaldo, brought in Lukaku, brought in Grealish, is like, with only Konato, who didn't even start. Can Liverpool kind of keep up and keep up yeah. with the title race? Because right now... I remember, I, I believe in the preview pod, I, I think I put Liverpool in second place to finish at the end of the season. I might drop them down a third at this point with mm. Man U kind of getting Ronaldo. And it would probably leapfrog them. But I don't know it's, it's it's a little rough. And it's it's a little different under this Klopp without glasses kind of year, which is kind of weird to see also. I don't know if you got LASIK or he's wearing contacts now. But. Yeah, I think he I think he did get <laughs> LASIK uh, surgery. So he's got no glasses go. anymore. New vision. <laughs> some, some 2020 maybe Klopp was, was seeing something that we're not seeing immediately but you know it's it's kind of like a weird year where it, although we didn't bring in that many new players we're getting a lot of players back from injury and yeah. also bringing in a lot of players that were on loan and maybe we'll be that prospect that you know Arsenal were trying to do and kind of bring up instead you know Harry Elliott is just one player rather than an entire team of just <laughs> prospects so we'll, we'll just have to see but you know, I think this game, it was the biggest game of the weekend and it was crazy. But at the same time, I guess for either team, it was kind of like a, a fair result, like mm-hmm. a one one where no one really dropped points besides just the two instead of just having like two dropping two points by, from the three and just each getting one. But huh, as you can see, I'm just a little frustrated <laughs> just from <laughs> dropping points at Anfield. I'm like, man, come on. This is the Liverpool now of yeah. like 2019. He's like, we got to make sure we just keep getting those dubs at home. Yeah, it seems like it was definitely a missed opportunity. And um, I don't know if if I was a just as like a neutral that, you know, as a fan of the Premier League, taking out my Manchester United fandom, 
I don't know. I personally would have liked to seen Liverpool kind of go out in the transfer market and strengthen some other areas on the team. I know their starting 11 is super strong already, but you know, they went out and got back up for their center backs, obviously because of the, the injury conundrum they had last season. But, you know, I would have liked them to see, you know, can they get a striker? Maybe if it's not Holland or one of the top strikers right now, could they find someone that was at least like a capable backup to provide some extra goals or, you know, could they add an extra, you know, winger out in Liverpool system or someone, um, you know, an attacking, like an extra attacking midfielder, someone that can provide uh, that different type of flair, different energy for Liverpool. Because, you know, as Tyler mentioned, you had City, you had Chelsea, you had Manchester United, all strengthened, you know, tremendously in the transfer window um, to get, you know, new talent up front or just new talent in general to really improve the starting eleven. I don't know. I, I think as a as a Liverpool, if I was a Liverpool fan, I would felt I would be. I, I know you mentioned Tyler that you're happy that they're at least getting all their injured players back, but I feel like I would have left like a little frustrated um, that the board didn't really attempt to make more of a a signature signing because you know after Konate, I I was following the transfer rumors all summer and I just cannot remember Liverpool being linked to another player like legitimately. I just cannot. I cannot remember them being linked to anyone else in the transfer window. I mean, we were also linked to Basuma from Brighton, who mm-hmm. I believe is a pretty good center mid. Yeah. Uh, you know, Klopp looked at his roster now. He saw Harvey Elliott come through. You know, Curtis Jones still here. Keita is back from injury. And, you know, there are a lot of players that we do have. And even for this game, too, I feel like a striker that we could have, not, not a pure striker, but like an attacking player we could have tried as Minamino of course I'm just Minamino bandwagon <laughs> but ultimately Klopp subbed in Samikas the left back who yeah. I know Robertson just came back from injury maybe it was kind of like load management there but I was like man we need to grab a goal he brings in Samikas yeah so I don't know it's uh there weren't really that many you know rumors that you just mentioned and you know all these players that I did also just mention were players that didn't really play last season so in a way, they were kind of new. But I will also mention that Liverpool did renew a lot of contracts this past summer as well, which is yeah. maybe where a lot of their budget went into. You know, Van Dijk got the new contract, Ali Sun, Trent, and I believe Fabinho as well. Yeah. So a lot of the core players got extensions. So that's probably why they couldn't really have the budget to bring in the players. But I mean, you're also Liverpool Football Club. Like, you got to yeah. be able to that, that, afford you know- <laughs> and that's that's what I, I I'm kind of left confused because I know they obviously the way they do transfers you know they try to you know balance out the books a lot more than some of the other top clubs in terms of you know being very you know smart about like okay if we bring someone in who can we sell to kind of balance out the books where can we get like the good deal but you know you know you're Liverpool like you're like one of the biggest clubs in the world not I wouldn't even say England like one of the biggest clubs in the world with a worldwide fan base you know you have a huge following you have tons of sponsorships you know you're owned by like Fenway Sports Group like a huge um you're backed by LeBron James who's also another famous uh you know athlete investor and such like I don't know that's where I'm kind of left confused now like why do they not get a little bit more money to just kind of splurge in the transfer market um because I you know I don't feel like it's a lack of resources because this is one of the biggest, one of the most successful European clubs out there. And I, I just feel like they, they can, I don't know. I, I don't know like the all in the ins and outs and such, but I feel like the money, like Tyler mentioned that you, you are Liverpool football club, like the money should be there and it should be there. Like, you know, when, when it's needed. And I, 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 I don't know. I, I just never see it. I just never see it happen that, that often. Mm-hmm. And I will say also kind of pushes towards ambitions and I guess the I guess outlook of what the ambitions of the club are. Because, you know, with that Ronaldo signing at Man U, you can tell it's like, all right, they're trying to win a trophy. But for mm-hmm. Liverpool, it's like, oh, we're bringing Kanate. And it's like, that's it. And, you know, re-signing players. It's like, I think they're just trying to maintain just Champions League at that point. I'm not sure about winning, but winning at all. But, I mean, we'll, we'll just have to see from there because... It's even that season when Liverpool did win basically the Premier League and the Champions League. Right before it, they basically made some big money signings, brought in Ali Sun and Van Dyke. Yeah. And, you know, under Ferguson at Manchester United, I always remember it. It's like even though the team was stacked, he would yeah, always add on top adding. of it. 
Yeah, like what City even... are doing with Grealish. Like mm-hmm. they didn't necessarily need Grealish, um, but they added on top of him to add extra competition and some extra firepower and just kind of like add a little bit of, I guess, scariness to the team that, oh crap, like they already have such a good team, but now they just added another really good player on top of that. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I felt like with Liverpool, I felt like as they were going in terms of like getting better under Klopp, you saw the investment of, you know, bringing players in. You know, they spent money on Salah. They spent money on Mane. Um, they spent a ton of money on Van Dijk. Um, obviously, because they sold Coutinho, so they had a ton of money to spend. That They spent money on Alisson, Fabinho. And then, um, you know, after that, obviously, they got Thiago on a pretty good deal. They got Konate on a pretty good deal. Um, but I guess to make sure you continue fighting for titles so you don't get complacent, I think it's important to also kind of uh, freshen up the squad and continue bringing in those, like, world-class players when you can. Um, because that's the only way that you could keep the, you know, keep the title charge on and just continue fighting for titles. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe slightly, you know, Klopp is very good about the loyalty of his players, even Mm -hmm. though, you know, you saw players like Robert Lewandowski leave Dortmund to Bayern. You saw Mario Goetze leave Dortmund to Bayern as well. Yeah. But some of the core players for Dortmund still stayed like Mats Hummels, Marco Royce, you know, Schmelzer, his check like all those players while he was Dortmund were always still there and then some even just stayed till they were retired like uh, Weidenfeller like things like that Mm -hmm. a goalie so maybe he's trying to still instill that kind of loyalty into Liverpool and I mean it's it's showing we're seeing players like Salah Mane Firmino like we've heard those names for like years now and you know Henderson's been there for years and you know Joe Gomez he was under the Brendan Rodgers era (laughs) and although under that Brendan Rodgers era majority of the team was eliminated and wiped out most of the players <laughs> <laughs> most of the players that Klopp has brought in mo- relatively most of them have stayed mm-hmm. and usually when you do hear one leave it's a pretty big deal like you know when one Aldum left it was a big deal when Shudin Shakiri left just like a couple weeks ago yeah I cried <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, so it's like you know it's a big deal when you bring in a player but it's also a really big deal when they leave mm-hmm. so I mean, you don't really get that at every single club. You know, like some players, like I would say like Chelsea players, when they leave the club, sometimes you don't even realize they left. Like Marco yeah. Van Ginkel is like, where is he? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's and a like, throwback. So, I mean, it, it's maybe it's like a cultural thing and things like that. But hopefully, you know, Klopp kind of stays true and actually kind of pulls through with this kind of big bet of just keeping with what he has and bringing up from the youth at times. And I mean, some, some of those bets did work like Trent Alexander Arnold. He was like a youth player. And instead of going on buying, we just brought up from the Academy and, mm-hmm. you know, with Harvey Elliott, it's kind of like the same scenario. So maybe, maybe that's what he's going for, but I feel like we still need the, the one striker and we haven't seen that from the Academy yet. Yeah. So, Oh, unless there's like an Ian rush or like a Kenny dog leash, just secretly <laughs> in there. Michael Owen. Yeah. You know, I got Michael Owen. That we just um, don't know about yet. That I haven't <laughs> heard any news about yet. Yeah, it's uh, it, that that's that's the one thing. Like, I think um, it's obviously very. I I'm a big believer in obviously believe in your academies and bring you know elevate those players and promote those players. But I think there's also needs to be a balance of you know bringing in some quality from outside and then letting your young players kind of develop. And then if they're ready to take the wing, then they can take that next step. Um, so, uh, you know, li- you know, Liverpool have have been successful the way they've been doing things the past couple of seasons. So obviously whatever they're doing is working, but I guess in this transfer window in the past couple of transfer windows where we're seeing the other teams kind of take, I guess a leap forward in terms of signing some big name players and really taking that next step with the players they are signing. Um, you know, part of me feels like maybe Liverpool is getting kind of left in the dust, but obviously, you know, Liverpool have been successful under Klopp doing it a certain way. So um, who am I to, you know, kind of judge and tell them that, you know, they're being left behind in the dust when they've been um, successful doing it that way. So, you know, we'll see as the season unfolds, like what happens with this Liverpool squad and, you know, kind of where Klopp takes them and um, takes them and such. But yeah, uh, I guess, uh, Tyler, do you have anything else uh, at all that? I know that was kind of a good wrap up on that one. Yeah, it was kind of like a jump, but of course, as we mentioned as well, like due to our technical difficulties, like some lightning kind of yeah. wiped out my house. So I'm kind of just on 
a hot spot right now. Yeah. I guess, hey, I guess technical God might be difficulties are not uh, not anything new to the Premier Pod. We've had our fair <laughs> share of difficulties in the past, but mm-hmm. you know, so we kind of kept it on just these few topics. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime. Yeah, uh, yeah. Had to had to cut out the the had to cut the outline just a tad bit short, just because of the the time constraints and obviously the the you know the technical difficulties we were running through, but. Um, you know, luckily we've got international break coming up next week. The end of the transfer window is going to be happening tomorrow because we're recording this on August 30th. Um, that will be fun to see what actually unfolds there. But, you know, next week we'll be uh, previewing um, the Champions League groups because now that they're official, official Champions League, Europa League, and just kind of rounding up some some big transfers from the uh, transfer deadline day and then gearing up for Premier League and uh, club football to uh, return after international break. But that kind of wraps up um, season four, episode 122. As we always say, you can follow us at the Premier Pod on Twitter and Instagram. You can give us a, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at the Premier Pod. Um, you can send us a question on our social media and we'll get back to you. Um, and also, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts and you'd like to leave this show a rating, that's more than welcome. We do appreciate it. It helps us get um, more notice out there on the podcast rankings. But obviously, if you don't want to leave a rating, that's totally fine. If you want to share this podcast with someone that enjoys soccer, loves the Premier League, that would be great too. Gets us out there and we do appreciate the support in any way we get it. Um, But once again, thank you guys so much for listening to Season 4, Episode 122 of the Premier Pod. Thank you guys. Peace. Peace.